Today, I'm joined by Dr. Michael Sarah. He is a cognitive psychologist and professor at Texas Tech University, where he runs the Learning and Metacognition Lab and does research on learning, memory, and metacognition. Dr. Sarah, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So could you give a brief overview of your research and then we can go into the details and talk about your background and stuff? Sure. So as you mentioned, um, I'm a cognitive psychologist. I study some very typical cognitive psychology topics such as memory. I mostly do, in that vein, I mostly do research uh, related to factors that can enhance memory, uh, both for, for basic or more theoretical reasons, as well as some applied reasons. I'm also a metacognition researcher. Um, if you're not familiar with metacognition, I'm sure we'll talk about it a lot today, mm -hmm. but basically it's thinking about monitoring, controlling other mental states or mental processes. So a lot of the research I do in that domain, some of it does relate to memory. So it's how can people monitor their memory? How can they make predictions about whether they will or will not remember something? Uh, I study metacognition as do many other researchers in the context of school learning, of studying. So anytime you're studying for a test, you make some evaluation of how well have I learned this information? How well do I think I will do in the test? Should I keep studying? Should I stop studying? Should I change my study strategy? Should I go for extra help? That's all metacognition. So a lot of the more applied metacognition research I do has to do with um, trying to increase how well students can evaluate what they've learned, what they need to study. Um, the more basic theoretical metacognition research I do is basically judgment and decision-making research. So uh, looking at the biases and errors that people make when they judge other mental states or mental processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you mentioned enhancing memory, it sounds like this this sort of cyborg thing, but you mean enhancing yeah. through like through like learning and metacognition about thinking about what's a more effective strategy and what can I do? Yeah, way. so I don't do any um, crazy meta memory enhancement research, no. Um, it's pretty typical stuff. So, and really looking at, <clears throat> not so much at, stra I don't really look at strategies for increasing memory as much as factors that enhance memory. Mm -hmm. So one recent um, subtopic of that I've been interested in recently is this weird effect that people are more likely to remember information that has to do with animate or living concepts compared to inanimate or non-living concepts. Mm -hmm. And that it's a really simple effect. It's really easy to get in the laboratory. And yet there isn't really a good understanding of why this effect occurs. Um, I think it has something to do with linguistic properties that underlie those two subcategories. So in other words, um, I don't think it's a memory enhancement that we necessarily, uh, you know, that, that has, something is alive, so therefore it makes it more memorable. Yes, that's true, but I think there's underlying linguistic properties of those categories. Uh -huh. So, uh, for example, animate living things tend to be more visually imageable. They tend to be more mentally arousing. They tend to be more exciting. You know, lions and tigers and bears versus like tables and chairs. Um, it's a lot easier to remember more interesting things. So I even though this effect is, is really easy to get and it's yet perplexing, uh, plenty of researchers are working on this uh, question and haven't figured out what's doing, what, why this effect is occurring. Mm -hmm. um, and you would think it would be pretty easy to figure out, but actually that one is, is a bit of a head scratcher. Are there any um, evolutionary approaches to it? Like thinking maybe, th thinking about yeah. living things is more relevant to survival than like categorizing non-living things? Exactly. So a lot of the, um, the research on that topic comes from evolutionary psychology or adaptive memory research. A lot of the big names there, you know, James Nairn, uh, his former grad student who's now a professor himself, Joshua Van Arsdale. Um, there's a bunch of other teams involved in that. They came at that, they kind of identified this effect. They came at it from an adaptive memory or evolutionary psychology perspective, as you just suggested, which is the idea that, well, presumably our ancient ancestors had to remember more information that was relevant for living things. 
such as prey animals, predatory animals, or their locations. Uh, the identities or locations of potential mates, of friends, of allies, of enemies, of competing uh, tribes or something. Um, whereas certainly there are non-living things such as sources of, of water, um, shelter that are important for survival. Um, the idea is that over time, our cognitive systems might have been become attuned to noticing and remembering living things versus non-living things. I certainly think that's possible. Um, it's a very hard hypothesis to test directly. You right. can't, unless you can show that there's a genetic, genetic factor that predicts who has this effect and who doesn't, or which species of animals might have this effect and which don't, it's really hard to come up with a true test of that adaptive explanation. It's easy to come up with an adaptive story. It's harder to test it. Uh, yeah. For that reason, although, sorry to cut you off, I know you're trying to jump in, but um, for that reason, although um, I certainly believe that that could have, have contributed to this effect, um, I don't study this particular effect from an evolutionary perspective. I tend to study it from a here and now. We know this effect occurs, regardless of where this effect came from. What produces this effect now in humans? You know, mm -hmm. Is it a linguistic difference? Is there two different brain regions. Now, in fact, there are slightly different brain regions. You can see different brain activity, whether someone is thinking about a living thing versus a non-living thing. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's very possible that you can come to some conclusion that does support an evolutionary uh, or adaptive explanation there. Uh, it's just not the approach I directly take. I'm mostly looking at um, current causes. Yeah. Is it strictly living versus non-living or is it more like animated versus non-animated? So that's, a, a that's, another, is living. Yeah, that's another great question. Um, some researchers have looked at that. So it does seem that overall living versus non-living is the primary factor here. But I think what you're getting at is there's many confounds. There are many things that are different about living versus non-living things. Mm -hmm. One of which is movement or animation. Um, some researchers have tried to get participants to think about non-living things as being moving or animated to think, or versus to think about living things as not moving, as a still image. Um, you can make the effect bigger or smaller by doing those things, um, but it's not explaining everything. Mm -hmm. But, but again, I think, I think what's happening is there's a lot of factors mm -hmm. that are confounded with living versus non-living that are probably contributing to the effect. Uh -huh. Do you see this effect in both children and adults? That's a good question. Um, I think some researchers have started to look at this effect with children. And I, off the top of my head, I don't know what they found. Mm -hmm. um, I also don't know of any you know, uh, older adult research, for example. I assume older adults would show the same effect. I don't know why they would not. Children might be different if they haven't yet if a lot of this is some top-down processing difference, um, children might not show this effect, at least not an early, at an early age. It might develop over time. It might also differ by culture. So there's some idea that this effect could be bigger or smaller uh, across cultures. Some cultures care more about living versus non-living. Their language is set up differently to, to stress whether something is alive or not versus other languages like English uh, and, uh, for example, U.S. culture doesn't, we, we certainly acknowledge this thing is alive, this thing is not alive, but it's not front and center in our everyday thinking. It, it plays a role certainly in our everyday language. Uh, you know, speaking English, we, we do treat uh, just by the structure of our language, living things differently than non-living things. Non-living things are rarely the subject of a sentence compared to living things, for example. Yeah, one of the reasons I ask is because you see with young children, like in stories, you have Goodnight Moon or you have the Cars movies or Thomas the Tank Engine, like all of these non-animate things become animated. And you mentioned yeah. that we're better at learning when, when things are animated. So I'm wondering if maybe, maybe the reason that happens is because children can learn better if they put a face on something. That's a, that's a good idea too. Um, so there is some research, it's not so much on this effect per se, but it is a type of, um, you know, oh, I can't think of the word, 
anthropomorphism type effect where with children's books, for example, or children's learning materials, you do get some benefit to anthropomorphizing content, even if it's a non-living thing. You know, we tend to shy away from this once you get to like junior high and above, high school, college, where we, we don't want to distract you, you know, pretending that a physical organ in your body has a mind or that this non-living thing is, is uh, purposely engaging in action. For children, it helps. It does help their comprehension. It does help their learning. It can be confusing, it seems, when you're actually talking about animals for children, um, ironically, because they are alive. But once you get too anthropomorphized, uh, they start to think about animals as being too human, you know, which can impair, it depends on what you're trying to teach them, I guess. Yeah, um, and you also have things like, what do you mean a unicorn doesn't exist, but a giraffe does, okay. like a, a horse with a horn versus this crazy, tall, spotted, weird animal? Yeah, so uh, again, I, I wish more research has been done to date with children. I just don't know of much. I think what you're hinting at is a great research question, though, um, which is, you know, do children treat uh, anthropomorphized or artificially animated made alive non-living things just like animate things will they show an animate memory advantage uh, for such things um, with college-age students for example they don't show that effect so college-age students at least in uh, i have some data on this i i'm sure other people do too you can generally agree get most people to agree like you know a tiger is alive a human is alive this table is not alive. This rock is not alive. You know, like most researchers, I think, agree on those types of things. Mm -hmm. But there's a ton of things in the middle, you know, that depending on how you define living or non-living, depending on or animacy, whatever, people draw that separation differently. And some people argue it's a gradient. It may be a gradient. But sometimes you have to draw a line. And the question is, well, where does a robot go? If your definition of animacy or living is things that can move of their own volition. Robots can count. You know, your Roomba that vacuums the floor, you don't have to tell it to vacuum. It, you know, it can vacuum on its own. Is that alive? Or a fantasy animal, a dragon, a unicorn. Um, college students recognize that those are not living things. They might have living, the properties of living things, but because they are not real, they tend to treat those things like inanimate things in terms of this memory effect. Probably not in terms of linguistics. So if we had a story about a dragon or a story about a unicorn, uh, I'm guessing that they would treat a fantasy non-real animal as being living you know, in the context of a story. Mm -hmm. But it, it, you, don't, you don't see this in memory effect on, on fantasy animals. You also don't see this type of memory effect on food products even foods that are from animals. Right. So, which kind of goes against that survival or adaptive memory explanation here. Because certainly, if we're going to say that people are likely to remember, more likely to remember living than non living things because they're relevant for survival, they should show a similar effect for most food products, especially food products coming from animals. But they don't. As soon as you cut that animal up, it becomes a non living thing to people's, mm -hmm. at least for people's memory. You know, they might not truly think about the concept that way but in terms of memory yeah you don't see the, that effect mm -hmm. do you think that relates to the social brain hypothesis at all at all dunbar showed that like your brain gets bigger as as population size get big, gets bigger in primates um i'm not 100 percent familiar with that effect um so you might have to explain it a little more you know, I, I probably wouldn't do it justice, but but I, okay. um, from what I know, it's just that among primates, you know, humans are like the most social species and also the smartest. And then in between, you have like some with smaller brains and they organize in smaller groups and then it gets larger and larger, the groups, and then also brain size gets larger. And the idea is something like you need, you need to be more intelligent to manage like a larger social sphere. And then a social sphere is also like, you know, animated. Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't know if if the living or non-living is as important there, but certainly it, it becomes computationally difficult. You need more brain power to to do the more advanced things that you know we take for granted, mm -hmm. um, such as maintaining a mentor. And this is is somewhat related to metacognition. Um, 
a, a topic called theory of mind, for example, which is our ability to think about other people's mental states or imagine what other people are thinking about or to know and represent what other people know. Mm -hmm. So that certainly is um, computationally intensive. Even humans who have a temporary or permanent cognitive impairment, all of a sudden they struggle with those tasks that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. um, so it certainly, you know, the first part certainly makes sense that you need more brain power to be a more social animal, to be able to maintain relationships, to be able to talk to each other, to have some idea of, of you know, a running estimate of what this person knows, what this person's feelings are, to have a good conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. And then if, if a lot of that, especially in the case of theory of mind, has to do with, I guess, a more specialized process for judging, judging thinking about things that are animated, I guess mm -hmm. maybe that specialization might translate over into this memory effect. That's just speculating, but. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I see where you're going. I think that's a really uh, interesting question. Um, it would, of course, be hard to look at this effect um, in any other species besides humans, but you certainly could, can. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, as you're, you're, you're hinting, the more intelligent primates, certainly the apes, probably a lot of the, the African monkeys, for example, they do laboratory experiments all the time. Mm -hmm. They can do memory tasks. I don't know if anyone has looked at this type of effect in other primates besides us. Uh, it would certainly make sense if more social animals, uh, maybe even not just primates, um, even uh, dogs, um, herd animals, as long as they're intelligent enough to do cognitive tasks, um, they might have, they might show this effect more uh, or at all compared to other species that don't have a social aspect like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think your hypothesis is really good. I don't, I don't think anyone has looked at this yet. There might certainly be even older data that suggests that um, some non-human species might show some type of processing or memory uh, advantages for thinking about other living things versus non-living things. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. mentioned linguistic effects that, that might come into play for memory, and that would seem to be uniquely human if that's the case, right? And we don't have to talk about it within the context of this specific example, but just sure. in general, could you go over that? Uh, whether, say it again? Um, so linguistic effects on memory, I guess that's to say something about well, I, I wasn't exactly sure um, what you meant by that, but it seems like whatever finding that would be, it, if, if there are influences on our memory that are unique to specific properties of language, mm -hmm. then that would sort of rule out any, any more, um, I guess, biological explanation or something that could be viewed in animals too. So the, the aspects I was trying to get at there are almost like the things that are related to a concept. Um, and maybe calling it linguistic effects is not the right word for it. But, you know, what we don't know is even the smartest non-human animal species, we don't know anything about what their concepts are like. Um, certainly I know, you know, if I say wolf to you or most human participants, you're going to have more mental arousal, even though it's not, there's not a real wolf in the room, just thinking about it. Is, or snake, you know, snake is one of the, or cobra or anything like that, is one of the most mentally arousing everyday words, you know, you could throw at someone or a weapon word, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly animals that are naturally afraid or fearful of snakes or wolves, they might show the same effect if they saw a wolf or a snake, even if it couldn't get to them. They might show fear, they might show aggression, they might have whatever reaction. Um, but what, what happens to them if that animal isn't actually there? So, you know, that's one of the major differences, I think, between humans and any other animals, is we have no idea of what their mental representation is like, but in particular for something that is not present. So, um, what really I meant earlier is what are attributes of that concept that get activated um, when people are, you know, they're, they're studying these words in memory tasks. They're not usually made to think very deeply about them. Mm 
Nevertheless, humans are smart. You show us a word, we activate things that have to do with it. So we don't really know what is being activated there. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think I'm answering your question very well at all. <laughs> most sorry. extreme animal example I can think of with regard to mental representation mm -hmm. is apparently koalas, they'll eat their eucalyptus leaves off the tree, but if you take the leaves off and try to serve them on a plate, they won't recognize them as food. And, and they have like one of the smallest brain to body ratios of all animals. And then, you know, most animals aside from that can probably recognize food, whether it's like on a tree or on a plate mm -hmm. or wherever. Mm -hmm. And it seems like Maybe, maybe this is a bit of a jump, but it, it seems like to do that, you have to be able to build a representation of like, this is food. You, you would think, um, but it's very possible, for example, just to play devil's advocate, that um, none of these animals have any mental representation of food. Mm -hmm. um, and I tend to, honestly, I'm pretty liberal in terms of thinking about the cognitive abilities and states of animals. Um, so I, again, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but you can certainly say that for any of these animals, it might not be, they might not need a concept of food. They might not need a concept of hunger. All they might need is, you know, a dog, for example, is mostly going to use smell. Does this smell like food? Does this smell edible? Does it smell good or bad? Uh, maybe taste, they might taste it. Um, and that might be the only determining, or the primary determining factor of whether I can eat this or not. A koala, maybe, I don't know, based on your what you provided, I'd have to guess. Clearly, they're not just using sight, smell, or taste. Because if they were, it wouldn't matter where the branches are, if they fell on the ground or fell from the tree. So they might have, what might matter more to them is location. Is this thing in a tree? It might also be a, a combinational rule. It might have to smell right, look right, taste right. It might also have to be in a tree. You can easily, this is where I see evolutionary explanations are handy, but then it's hard to test. It's like, did they evolve to, to be more likely to eat food that's still in a tree? Because it might be fresher, it might be healthier. If eucalyptus falls off the tree, maybe it smells kind of the same, maybe it looks kind of the same, but it's lost its nutrients. I don't know. I'm not a biologist. So, um, you know, it's possible that they're just using, they have, to have no clue of what they're doing or thinking about. And they're just using low level information. It looks like eucalyptus, it's up in a tree. I'm gonna eat it. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely straying a bit from your expertise so we can dial it back no, there. Fine. But um, so for your interest in learning and memory, is it more philosophical? Like how do we learn? How do we conceptualize ideas? Or is it more practical? Like you want to, to see um, better education and stuff like that? Yeah, I would say in that regard, um, I'm way more applied. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly care about the, you know, the underlying processes, the underlying uh, reasons why some students perform better in school than others. But um, ultimately, yeah, my goal is hopefully to make learning better and make students better, mm -hmm. able to study on their own, for example, or just to do better on tests, to learn more in class, to make classes more engaging, you know, or learning in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this reminds me of one of the questions I was thinking of, wondering. Is there any benefit to having poorer me uh, memory ability or poorer metacognitive ability? Because no matter how much you can improve it, mm -hmm. some people are still going to be worse than others. And mm -hmm. well, that kind of, that's kind of a sad truth, I guess, unless there's some hidden benefit. So it's a good question, because certainly intuitively you would say, no, it would be better memory is better across the board. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably true, I would say, in most regards. <clears throat> now, you do have some people, it's pretty rare, but at this point, uh, the researchers who do this have identified a few hundred people in the world who have a condition called hyperthymesia. And this is a condition where these people can remember basically any episodic memory, any life event they experienced. Now, these people are actually no better at memorizing facts than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Because memorizing, so they're no better at school learning, because school learning for the most part is about basically about facts. Even if your test isn't ultimately about memory, it's comprehension. That's all memory for facts. This is a different memory system that uses different underlying architecture. This is memory for things you actually experienced in life. They can remember pretty much anything. Now that happened to them. They can tell you the date without doing, you know, you can give them some event, uh, in their life, 
um, and hopefully you're able to verify this, but they can tell you what date it was without doing mental calculation. Uh, they can tell you what the weather was. They can tell you what they wore that day. They can tell you what they ate. Uh, they can tell you step by step what they did, what they said, what other people said, almost like they'll, they're playing back a video. Um, many of these people report seeing, um, it, when you ask, you give them a date, what happened in your life on this date? they see visual organizations. So many of them report seeing almost a calendar that they can scroll through. Mm -hmm. With Many of them report very similar organization, um, calendar years, months, days, and they can sort through it and basically play a video back. Now that is abnormal um, and it's certainly fantastical. These people don't seem to show other, they are basically normal in all other regards, as far as we can tell. They are do have a downsides. Uh, I'm sorry? Are there any downsides to having that ability? Right. So, yes. So many of these people report, um, although it's handy in some regards, um, at the least it's interesting. It's a cool parlor trick. Many of them report that, unfortunately, when they think back to past sad events, for example, or negative events, it's just as hurtful now as it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Whereas for most of us over time, we might forget a negative event or it just feels less intense now. So we might think about a really sad past event, but um, we have this advantage of, you know, time, the, the phrase time heals all wounds uh, applies to most of us. It doesn't apply to people with hyperthymesia, at least not in the same way. Yeah, so, makes, sorry. That makes sense. Yeah. So it's, it's in some ways it's a double-edged sword. You know, we take it, in some ways for granted, there, they, there could be some benefits to forgetting or at least to changing memories over time. Does the opposite effect exist? People who can remember any facts, but they have poor or average personal or episodic memory? Um, certainly. So some people memorize large quantities of information using mnemonics. So again, these are people who are uh, cognitively, functionally, neuroanatomically uh, uh, neurotypical or normal, for lack of a better word. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything special or different about them. They're using techniques to memorize information. So people who memorize thousands of digits of the number pi, uh, people who go, who go on Jeopardy, they're all very good at studying and learning, retaining, retrieving information. Um, there are certainly have been some people who are very good at, at retaining factual-based information uh, some of them show, you know, perhaps have those abilities because of non-typical neurodevelopment. One of the most famous examples, it was a man named Kim Peek. He's the person that the character Rain Man in the Dustin Hoffman, Tom Cruise movie, Rain Man, was based on. Um, he, even though the Rain Man character in the movie uh, is said to have, to be on the autism spectrum, uh, Kim Peek actually had a different condition. And it produces not only physical abnormalities. So he had, for example, a very large head. Um, he did have some motor deficiencies, um, but not only was it, it was his head very large, his brain was very large. His brain was almost split brain. So he had almost no connections or corpus callosum between the two halves of his brain. So he was so separate that in fact, he could read two pages of a book at the same time with each eye. So he could open a wow. book, he could read both pages at the same time, because in many ways, he had two brains. Um, I don't think he or anyone asked him if he experienced two existences. I don't think he did, but he was split enough that he could take in information differently. Now, he had an ability, um, he could memorize books, you know, he could just look, read them once and memorize them. Um, he doesn't seem to have been using strategy. He seems to have had a brain that could take in information with little to no effort and record it. And then he could retrieve it later. You see that in the movie. Again, even though the character Raymond um, is loosely based on him. Uh, you know, there's a scene in the movie where he gets bored. Tom Cruise tries to push him away and he gives him like a phone book and he starts memorizing the names and phone numbers in the phone book, you know. So um, now in that case, probably no difference, probably normal episodic memory, unless um, 
you do have a, a non-typical condition that could impair episodic memory. Um, it's certainly very possible. Mm -hmm. Are there different functions between like, let's say memorizing book, memorizing every single word, but then also translating that into be, being able to summarize the meaning readily? Are those different processes or would, would they be one and the same? They're certainly related or correlated, but I would say they're different processes. So um, a lot of people, you know, are critical, for example, of school learning or instruction or tests that seem too memory based. Students hate to memorize facts. Um, you know, other critics of the educational system say, well, you know, people don't need to learn facts. You can always look up facts. You need understanding. Certainly understanding is important. Being able to take information and apply it to a new situation, for example, is very important as well. Um, but all of those things are difficult, if not impossible, if you don't remember anything. You can't have comprehension without memory. You can have memory without comprehension, but they tend to correlate, um, you know, and, and it seems to be somewhat cyclical. It's hard, it's a chicken and egg problem. Um, but I would say you certainly need memory first. You could build comprehension on top of that. And then having better understanding of something allows you to take in more information better. So experts, for example, on a topic, they can learn new information related to that topic better than novices. Mm -hmm. because they have more information to relate it to. Yeah, that makes sense. So how much of the variability from, from your ability to learn or memorize things, how much of that has to do with genetic or, or brain size factors and how much of it is like uh, your conscious strategizing or, or environment or stuff like that? Yeah, so um, in humans, uh, as well as within most species, brain size is not usually predictive of of learning, of intelligence, or very much. What really matters, um, acro even across species, uh, is what structures do you, does this species have or not have? What functionality goes along with those structures? Another thing that matters is connectivity. So, you know, you were hinting earlier, you know, as we evolved, if you go down the primate, the primate uh, branches of, of evolution, you certainly see brains getting larger relative to our body size. But what seems to matter more is the frontal lobe of the brain getting bigger and bigger and bigger uh, compared to many other species. You know, many species proportionately, just looking at the brains, how much of the brain is frontal lobe, a much greater amount of our brain is frontal lobe compared to many, most other species. Uh, and it's where we do most of our higher order thinking. So um, to go back to your question, brain size probably doesn't matter. Um, unless you're talking about someone who has a very atypical, in some way, brain or brain damage. Um, overall, humans should basic, most humans should be basically capable of learning many things um, or most things. Now, why do people differ? Um, certainly we have this vague concept called an IQ or intelligence uh, or something along those lines. Um, those seem to differ. Now, the hard part there is defining intelligence or defining IQ. Um, there is not, we all know what it is and yet there is no easy way to define it. Um, one of the, I think one of the jokes in at least in cognitive psychology is how do you define intelligence? Well, intelligence is defined by what is on the intelligence test. Um, and in many ways, you know, that's true of many uh, factors of, of humans or even of other animals. Um, the concept is, is vague. It's really, what are you measuring? Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, some intelligence tests, you know, can certainly be criticized for being way too fact-based. Many intelligence tests, more modern ones, are um, about more abstract thinking of problem solving. And all those things sound like intelligence. And probably there is a, like a nugget of truth under all of these, that these things tend to go together. They tend to correlate and just different measures of intelligence might focus on one more than the other. Um, again, to go back to your question, I think a lot of school learning type differences in intelligence or in performance or just different grades, GPAs, whatever you wanna say, however you wanna operationalize it, um, a good portion of that comes down to 
are students engaging in the topics differently? Um, there might be underlying differences in some form of ability or some form of motivation, for sure, that can play in as well. Um, as a you know, as a professor, as someone who teaches classes, though, um, if you if you haven't taught, I, you know, I know one thing that will happen at some point. You get back your tests, and some student comes up to you and says, "I studied really hard. Why did I get a low grade?" And usually, what I ask them is, "Well, how did you study?" and Usually what you find is they might have studied for a long amount of time. They might have put in what felt to them like effort. And for them, it might have truly been effortful. But if it's a, a poor strategy that they use, such as rereading, um, once you read and understand something, rereading has very limited further gains. Um, some students do even other things, like they reread notes or rewrite notes. Um, Again, that doesn't help as much as um, as truly testing, doing practice testing, for example, is, is helpful in, in a number of ways. Um, so in other words, one, one thing I think does greatly differ is how do students study? How do students not only study, but how do they engage in class learning or while they're doing an activity? Some might be very passive. Some might be much more actively engaged mm -hmm. and participatory. So at any point in the process, you know, different students are engaging in different processes for whatever reason, and it's producing different outcomes. And it, it seems so obvious when, when you say it that way, and yet to many students and, and even other critics of education, um, you know, it, people I think expect that everyone should, if everyone was in the same class, everyone should come out with the same learning. And that's just not gonna happen unless everyone does everything the same exact way. Right. So this would be a good place to try and compare as many different strategies as we can. So the first one that comes to mind is chunking, because even if you're studying the same amount of time, it's better if it's spaced out rather than done in like one night, right? Yes. So um, what you're talking about is spaced practice, right? Or spaced learning versus chunking. Now, chunking is a technical term for it. Students probably use a term called cramming, right. which is doing all the studying the night before. Or some form of that. So that's, you know, cramming the night before is bad for several reasons. You usually have less time the night before than if you had spaced it out. Now you gave a scenario where you have the same amount of time, either in one whole chunk or spaced out in smaller parts. Um, even spacing it out in smaller parts, the same amount of time is going to be better. You have, um, you know, for several reasons, you have a little bit of retrieval every time you engage in another session, you have to pull what you studied last time out of memory to think about it again. That enhances memory. It also enhances comprehension. Um, there's that. Um, I, I just can't get over, I mean, there's just the, the reality of cramming the night before is just not useful because you just usually have less time. Now, again, with the fixed time, um, I knew what I want to say. Another advantage of spacing it over time is you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So sleeping enhances memory um, for the things, especially for newly learned information. Um, you need, you know, there are processes that go on while you sleep that make memory stronger, make it much more likely you can remember them in the future. So if you cram the night before and don't go to sleep, you obviously can't take advantage of that at all. If you cram the night before and do manage to sleep before the before the test, um, that might help, but this is still not the same long-term increase in memory that you would see as if you had been studying a little bit each night, a whole week before, for example. Yeah, do we know how sleep helps with memory? Or is it one of those mysteries, but it's like, we know it happens? Um, we certainly know it happens in terms of the fine, uh, details of the neurology of it, you might need uh, a more neuro-based researcher to tell you that. Uh, certainly, it does seem to increase um, long-term potentiation. So um, over time, you know, part of this sleep process, what it's doing is making it, uh, is making the neural connections more efficient so that in the future you can retrieve this. This is often why mm -hmm. um, if you think of, if you have a dream one night, your dreams tend to be about something you experienced that day. Right. Uh, in part, it, it seems because the brain has to reactivate what you experienced that day 
in order to go through this process of eventually turning them into long-term memories. Now, within a week, you know, within a few days or within a week or two, those memories are still basically in, in hippocampus. So they're not actually becoming true permanent long-term memories until much later in this process, in which case, you know, that's not going to matter for a test this semester. That's only going to matter for if you're, you know, for tests in your major, like across semesters, across years, that term of long-term potentiation, where over time, those memories will go from your hippocampus to your outer cortex and essentially become permanent. So um, that's about as much as I know about the physical okay. process. So there's, there's also a difference between the type of memory where it's like, you, you have a multiple choice test, let's say, and you recognize the right answer. But if you were asked to kind of just write down the right answer from your own memory, uh, some, some people find that a lot harder. So what, what are the different processes involved in sure. those two types so of retrieval? If, with, the, with the fill in the blank type question, or even an essay type question, where you're given a prompt, assuming you have the information, obviously if you don't know the information, you, you can't give it back, right? Assuming you have it, the question is, how well does this question in front of you prompt you to be able to retrieve information, hopefully correct information? We can talk about lure questions or, or false uh, positives here. But the question there is, can you, do you have, if you have the information, can you retrieve it now? Can you spit it out? Can you write it down? With multiple choice, you don't need to do that in theory. So it would help, obviously, if you know the answer if seeing the question even just prompts the right answer, and then you're selecting it from the options. Now, we've all encountered a multiple choice question where we maybe don't really know the answer. So what we have to do is narrow it down. So in that case, most people use some form of familiarity. These answers seem familiar and these don't. Or in this context of this question, this answer seems possible. Uh, it could be logically possible. You might be able to, you know, making an educated guess, narrow it down based on facts that you do know. So it is overall properly designed multiple choice questions uh, probably do tap a very different form of thinking. Um, unless you just make it, you know, you're, you're as a designer of a multiple choice question, if the student know, literally knows the answer, then it doesn't really matter what the options are. Um, now this is where I guess people designing multiple choice questions could be tricky if they want, they could purposely put in confusing lures. It's not usually why people are designing multiple choice questions, but it does, I usually try to design multiple choice questions for my courses uh, to show discrimination, to, to show that my students do understand all of these concepts, but that they can specify when this one applies versus when this one. To get at that, I mean, I, my goal I try to design groups of multiple choice questions that I can use where like, let's say the same four responses are applicable for five or six different questions. And I usually chunk them on the test. I put them right all together um, because I don't care if I'm using multiple choice then I don't care if the student can necessarily retrieve information on their own. What I care about is, does the student understand all these concepts well enough so that they know when option A applies and when option B applies. So in that case, I'm hoping for them to show understanding by being able to pick the right option at the right time. Now, the one reason I like to use, I'm gonna to try to use these four options for five or six different questions is now they can't do it necessarily based on familiarity. Oh, I remember him talking about option A in class. I don't remember him ever saying option B or C in class. And that's assuming they were in class and remember things correctly. Yeah. But assuming that there's some validity there, if A, B, C, and D are all things I talked about in class, and not only that, there are options of five or six different questions, then the only way to answer the question is to know, right, anyway, is to know what the difference between those things are. So that would be my yeah. hope. So how do you combat people learning for Learn, learning just enough to know how to ace the test and then like the moment after it's done, it's all out the window versus hopefully remembering stuff that's gonna, that's gonna stay with them and benefit them long-term. That's a hard one. Um, certainly to the extent that a, an exam is mostly based on facts 
or retrieving information or doing these low level recognition on multiple choice, for example, um, then your test is probably not gonna do anything about long-term learning or long-term understanding. You probably also didn't teach it in terms of long-term understanding because, I mean, maybe it's a stereotype, but if you're making an exam that's really just about low level facts, you probably taught the course about low level facts. Now, maybe you didn't, but one way to get around it is as you're designing courses or de deciding what to talk about, um, certainly there are always little things that just aren't important. They're only important in chapter three, you know, and once I get beyond chapter three, there's no other point in me ever mentioning them again. But in most topics, and it's not just psychology, you know, as an instructor, there is probably bigger topics at play that maybe they come up first in the book in chapter two, but then they're super relevant in every other chapter. Um, so to try to always go back to those things can help because then the students constantly have to retrieve that information. So in other words, as both a teacher and even as a learner, relating new information to old information, not as I said before, related to comprehension, not only helps you to learn the new information, it helps enhance your memory and your understanding for the old information as well, because you're constantly thinking about it again. Um, you see some, at least in psychology, you see this, um, some more modern textbooks, they are organized now with some overarching themes that they try to spread across or bring up in all the chapters. So even though each chapter might have kind of its own topic or standalone set of topics, they try to always relate it back to a few of these bigger picture topics so that hopefully the students are, have a running flow of information that they can always relate the new information back to. That's certainly one way to do it as you're teaching a course. Now you could do the same thing with a test. You know, I don't use cumulative exams in my courses, at least not explicitly cumulative. You know, I don't do a cumulative final exam, which is you know an exam over every chapter I cover in the class. But nevertheless, there are some really important topics that I'm always going to go back to. So, for example, when I teach undergraduate research methods, um, even though like one of the first things I cover is how do you design a true experiment. That's so important to me. It's going to show up on every exam. I'm always going to ask them how to, you know, design. here's a research question, design an experiment to examine it. Um, and hopefully over the, the exams in the course, that's getting more difficult because I'm bringing in more and more requirements from the later chapters. But the overall, the core question there is, can you design a research, you know, can you come up with a research question? Can you design a study that answers it? That's such a key component of my course that, I need to constantly keep making sure not only that testing to make sure the students get it, but as I teach and as I test, I want to keep making sure the students are, are thinking back to it. They're not just learning it once for the first test and then never again being asked about it. Yeah, I've noticed in my own classes, myself and, and most people I know, if, if, if they're non-cumulative, you'll do whatever you need, like the, mm -hmm. the first test, and then you just forget about all of that. And then for the next test, you only focus on mm -hmm. the next chapters. So I, so in some sense, it's kind of easier to do better on those because yeah. you just focus where you're studying. And then in the ones that are cumulative, you just like it more yeah. because you have to kind of review everything. But then I also noticed that I come out of those yeah. having learned more because it kind of forced me to go over stuff and not, not just say I can dismiss this. What you just said reminds me, your question earlier, are there any benefits of having like, well, I guess a bad memory? Um, probably not, but at the same time, our memory systems were designed to be somewhat efficient where when information isn't that relevant anymore, we tend to forget it. We also can purposely forget information. So sorry for, for going back for the callback there, but um, uh, it, it did come to mind that, you know, in many ways we're, you know, the students who do that, they're not, they're not bad. They're not wrong for doing it because in some ways it's efficient. If you truly know, I just have to memorize these facts to get an A on this test and I'm never gonna need them again. Now let's assume that's correct. Why would you remember them, you know? Um, so for, for most of us, you know, our cognitive functioning is, is efficient and strategic. We, we shouldn't waste our time trying to learn those things. Uh-huh. Yeah, so a lot of people critique 
our modern education system that it kind of incentivizes mm -hmm. students to, to to do that to to not truly learn but just to learn enough for the test what do you think about that i i think that's a fair criticism um it certainly is not true of every course taught by every teacher and it's not the approach that every student takes but yeah there's enough of it out there that i think the criticism is fair uh, or at least in specific cases it's fair and accurate mm -hmm. so there's with working out there's this term muscle confusion and the idea is if you're if you're targeting one muscle let's say even if you do the same the same intensity it's going to be better to do a bunch of different exercises for that muscle mm -hmm. rather than like doing one exercise the same amount of times. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if that comes into play with learning and memory. So it's like, if you have different study strategies, again, if you're gonna study the same amount of time, is it better to mix it up? Yes. So, and that, it even relates back to, you know, your earlier question about, about spacing in, uh, information out as during acquisition or study. Um, it not only helps to space it out, but to think about the information differently each time. So certainly, you know, as instructors, you might find, I, you know, I explain a topic one way, and maybe some of the students in the class get it, and a bunch of the other students in the class are sitting there with a quizzical look, they don't understand what I'm talking about. So now I have to explain it a different way, or I have to draw a picture on the board, or maybe I have to give them a reading assignment. And then the second time, more of the students understand it. Now, um, you know, is that just because I said the information twice? More likely, it's because I said it a different way. I used a different example. I used a different meta metaphor. Seeing it visually on the board helped rather than me just saying it out loud. Um, so usually, yeah, presenting information different ways not only can it increase memory, because you you form different mental representations, even though it's the same information, you link them together, but now you have multiple representations of the same information. You also increase your abstract understanding of them. Because if now you see, oh, he said the information two different ways, and now I understand the unifying construct underneath those two explanations, you've attained a higher level of understanding than if you had even gotten just one of those explanations to begin with. Um, so yeah, I think your, your instinct there and your metaphor with the muscle confusion is, is very good. Uh, mm -hmm. certainly makes sense. Yeah, that goes back to what you said earlier about um, about connecting, the ways you can connect things with things you already know. So like experts learning better for the same topic compared to novices, for example. Yeah, it does. Uh -huh. So I've heard one idea about memory is like, I don't know if I got this right, but it, it was something like mem when you remember, you're not truly remembering, but you're the thing itself, but you're remembering your last memory and then you sort of re-encode it each and every time. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So that's certainly true um, for episodic memories, um, which we were talking about earlier. So our memories for past events. Once you experience that event, you might form a memory of it. Um, every time you rethink about that, that memory, that past event, you reactivate it. Now, over time, you forget information. So you might just truly forget it and it's gone from the memory. Sometimes though, we fill in the blanks um, with information that maybe was not a part of that event. Um, so over time, your memories become seemingly stronger because you're, you're, you've reactivated and then put the memory back. You reactivated, put it back. That memory becomes stronger over time. But that same process can be ironic in that it, it can allow for the intrusion of, of non-relevant or non-true information into the event. So, so false memories. Yeah, false memories, distorted memories. Now, the same thing can happen to facts. It's just less likely that a fact is going to get greatly distorted. Now, certainly we make, you know, our, our factual memory can, can change over time in the same way. It's just with factual memory, it goes from presumably being true. It's either true or not true after that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it might be easier to notice. Um, but uh, with, with episodic memories, they're so complicated and because we're always filling in the blanks, we don't we don't experience it as filling in the blanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I recently did an episode with um, with a cognitive scientist who specializes in perception, and we were talking about um, color perception. and And I said something like, "I've heard Eskimos can see like can can." Or actually, we were talking about color and language. Can okay. see they talk about 
different shades of white and we would just look at a color and say white or it's slightly white blue and they have a whole bunch and he was like actually that's an urban legend okay um, so and and i noticed that now i still have that information in my mind but i think of that as here's this urban legend not here's this fact so it's okay. mm -hmm. so it's sort of like i guess the opposite of, of that false memory process because it was distorted but now it was distorted based on this new information yeah and in many ways that's you know that's a good thing um, it's good that you now have a memory for being corrected, basically, mm -hmm. um, because presumably, hopefully over time, you'll never revert back and start yeah. thinking that, <laughs> oh, Eskimos really do have all these different words for snow or white or something. Mm -hmm. um, so it's in a good way you've corrected the memory. And hopefully there's no longer that incorrect version floating around in your head that could accidentally come out. You know, mm -hmm. hopefully there's just the corrected version. Right. So how does that, how does that play into like, again, false memories in, in terms of people, people sort of being persuaded into thinking things that, that they didn't actually think. Does, does that make sense? Like, for example, let's, um, let's say that this Eskimo story was actually true and he just wanted to deceive me of that mm -hmm. for some reason, then it would have mm -hmm. worked. So, so you could imagine something like that could happen in the case of, you know, a, a true memory being distorted. Not that, not that I'm saying that about the Eskimos. Yeah. So that's a, you know, in many ways, you're talking about a misinformation effect. You, you did experience some event. Um, you have a relatively accurate memory for the event, and yet later in life, some other source of information comes in and says what you thought was incorrect. This is actually the correct way this event happened or this is actually the correct fact um it should matter how if, if you trust that person for one thing or that source um the other thing is over time you you, you would need to maintain memory um if you wanted to avoid putting that information into the memory and replacing it for example you would need to now have two separate representations i always thought that which you kind of do because that's actually what you're saying right now is you have a mental representation of, for many years, I thought this about Eskimo language. Later, this specific person, I have a memory of this specific person correcting me and telling me this counterfact. Mm -hmm. Yet, you know, if this was a purely efficient system, you would just take the corrected information and erase the old incorrect information. Right. But in, in this case, you actually have two sets of information here that are obviously still in there. Um, still, um, you know, you've resolved them. You've said, I thought this for years, this expert told me this other thing, yet I'm not, you know, erasing this memory. I'm just going to treat it as not valid anymore. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, what you've done in this example is pretty complicated. What many of us do, uh, especially if we're not aware of it, is we take in different sources of information and to resolve them, we do kind of get rid of one and keep the other. This is why over time, you know, probably the best way to study it is memory for um, major world events, because we know what truly happened. Therefore, we can assume how people likely experienced it at the first time. What we can look at over time, though, is how do different sources of information kind of interrupt that process and people start to lose um, their own memory. They start to bring in other people's memories that they've heard about. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the most famous examples, it's in most cognitive psychology textbooks. I don't, has, have you done false memory on this show before? No. Okay. So one of the most, back in the 80s when the Challenger blew up, right, the space shuttle Challenger, um, some cognitive psychologists were smart enough to say, literally the next day, they asked the students at their university, at the university, write down where you were yesterday when you found out or you saw, because most people watching it on TV, when you found out that the Challenger blew up, they wrote it down. Two and a half years later, they were able to bring a lot of those people back, probably because they were still at the university. Um, and they said, hey, remember a few years ago when the Challenger blew up? Write down exactly where you were when you found out or you saw it. And two and a half years later, people's memories had become distorted. Not that they didn't think that the Challenger blew up, but that, part of the memory is, is, you know, is fine. It's where was I, you know, how did I find out about it? People's memories had become distorted because other people's memories, other, they had heard other people's memories and stories over the years. So 
they lost track of what was my experience, what was their experience, or they saw things on the news and put that in, into the memory. Do you know um, in that example how many people just said they forgot? I don't know. Um, I actually don't even know if I've ever read the actual source article. I probably shouldn't be talking about it. Then. You, you see in, where I'm going with it because it, there, you might have it. I guess some people might be more prone to give a false answer rather than say, I don't know. And I'm, I'm not saying that about this yeah. specific example, but just mm -hmm. in general, it's kind of an interesting topic of, of how much, uh, how much of memory is actually false memory and how much of it is like your brain, you just didn't have the memory and then your brain, brain scrambles to make something up. Yeah. That's I, in that particular study. I don't know the answer. Um, in other false memory research where researchers purposely create false memories in the lab, early on in that process, partners can say, I don't know, I didn't see this. You're making me answer questions about things I didn't see. Mm -hmm. They know it. Over time though, they forget. They forget, you know, what you were talking about earlier, they're forgetting that there was an event where I had to make up information. So now over time, they just have the information that they made up or they provided. And to them, it's indiscernible from the aspects of the event that they did experience versus the aspects of the events that they were made to confabulate. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this happens, for example, in real life situations with eyewitnesses um, where intentionally or not, you know, an investigator asks them a leading question and they're made or they just willingly give information that they didn't actually see or they guess. Over time, they lose access to the creation of that information. And they misattribute the fact that they have the information to seeing it mm -hmm. as part of the whatever the part of the event they did witness. Um, so over time, people lose track of where they got information from. Now, certainly you're right. Um, there very well could have been a lot of participants who just said, I don't really remember. It was two and a half years ago. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, that's possible. I just don't know right. the data. Well yeah, but in, in this case, it was like such 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 a big event that I guess it might. Yeah. The term is flashbulb memory, right? If yes. something's yes. highly emotionally significant, you might remember it better. Yes, that's the. You know, this is where urban legend comes in. So the or the even this is really just lay naive metacognition. People think this event was so important, so therefore I formed this super strong, accurate memory of it. In fact, what happens with these major life events, whether they're world events or personal events, if they're really important, we tend to talk about them with other people. We tend to even just play them back in our heads or we see them on the news play back over and over again. You know, this challenger blowing up, at least people of my age, how many times in my life have I seen that on TV? 9-11, uh, how many times have we seen that on TV? Uh, my parents' generation, how many times have you seen the Kennedy assess? Even though you maybe watched it live or the moon landing live, how many times have you seen it on video? Um, these constant you know, playbacks just um, really throw a lot of this off. And they create this sense of, oh, I, I, it, I don't have memory for all these repetitions. I have memory for the actual original event. And it becomes hard to separate whether information is from the initial event or was it incorporated later. Uh -huh. So it's but like, you think it's because it was so significant, but then in reality, it's just because it keeps coming up over and over. So that exactly, the connection... exactly. Thank you. That was, that was the point I was trying to make. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, great. So I think we should close um, talking about your current research and plans for future research. Like what, what are some big questions you'd like to see answered? Sure. So, I mean, in, in terms of my metacognition research, one of my still driving questions is how do people make metacognitive judgments? So in the case of memory, for example, I put you in a memory task. I ask you to make predictions about how likely you are to remember any of these items or the overall test performance. Um, people are not great at that. Um, and what, one of the main things I study across you know, most of my studies and papers is how do people come to those, to make those judgments? What information do they incorporate um, and how do they do that? Uh, I've been mostly in my career doing that you know, in the laboratory with typical cognitive psychology behavioral tasks. Um, 
I have started uh, collaborating with one of my colleagues here at Texas Tech uh, named Tyler Davis, who is a neuroimaging researcher amongst other things. And um, we have been starting to look at this actually neurologically. Mm -hmm. how, how does the brain, the physical brain, take all these competing sources of information and put them together to come up with a judgment? Um, and that's not only useful for understanding how metacognition works, but even other judgments and decisions. It doesn't have to be metacognitive, but we're particularly interested in the metacognitive judgment because you would think that the physical brain would have some advantage here because unlike making a judgment about the real world, you're making a judgment about another mental state or a process. You would think in many ways that should be easy or accurate. Um, yet there's a great deal of distortion that happens in between the process that is occurring in one part of the brain, the metacognitive evaluation or monitoring of that process, which is happening in the frontal lobe. What is happening in between, you know, the two that makes it, you know, in some situations quite accurate in other situations quite faulty. What's happening in between there? Um, so we're hoping to take a more neurocognitive approach to that. Mm -hmm. um, cognitive psychology, is it usually kind of a stepwise approach? So it's like you yeah. might make some new finding purely cognitively, purely behaviorally, and then only once that's well established, then you go looking into how or why does this happen? Is yeah, I would, I would say stepwise and itty bitty baby steps is a very accurate description right. of, of at least the historical approach to cognitive psychology research. Uh -huh. So once you start using neuroimaging, you're generally researching things that are already, that you already know are going to happen. You just don't know necessarily how they're happening. Correct. So in this case, I mean, certainly plenty of researchers have done this without needing neuroimaging or without using neuroimaging. And it's, we're not expecting to find very conflicting information. We're hoping that we can find information that uh, is not available behaviorally. Another thing I've become interested in, and it's not just about neuroimaging, but even using other biophysiological responses. So I've recently started um, uh, talking about research collaborations in future directions with a researcher at uh, University of Central Florida named uh, Roger Azevedo. And he has a big interest in not just, um, you know, A, improving student learning, specifically using computerized tutoring, intelligent tutoring systems that help. So it's not, it's not what comes with your textbooks where it says, you got these questions wrong, go back and restudy. It's much more advanced. And this is a system that has some understanding of what you know and should know and how you should study and is trying to help you. What he's been looking at is using, rather than having people just make a judgment, like I think I understand this, I don't understand that. And then having this computer factor that into wh where it guides you to restudy. He's starting to use biophysiological responses, eye tracking, pupil size, heart rate, facial expressions as non-verbal and even non-conscious predictors of your, your cognition and your metacognition. Uh -huh. um, and I think that you know is another really uh, high potential future direction. Um, it has the advantage of not needing people to respond uh, it also could potentially, you know, even though it's noisy and it might not be purely predictive or perfectly predictive, um, it, it has other data advantages that um, you can use it in addition to or instead of these other types of reports. So I'm hoping overall, you know, that all this research gels together mm -hmm. and I come out with a better understanding of how people make metacognitive evaluations or even how um, the non-conscious uh, aspects of metacognition or self-evaluation occur. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's very interesting. So you mentioned towards the beginning that that your interests are much more applied rather than theoretical. And and you, I, yeah, you, you did give a good good overview of how how this could help improve student learning. But I want to flesh that out a sure. bit more. So so what would the the long term goal be if like let's say we have um, we we demonstrate some reliable findings on whether it's brain activation or like skin conductance or eye movement or whatever, what mm -hmm. would that do long-term for, for um, application? So ultimately, whether we're dealing with um, students studying completely on their own in some way, or with the assistance of a human tutor, teacher, or computerized tutor, for example, um, ultimately what we need to know is 
what does this student know? What does this student not know? Mm -hmm. um, and the student studying their own has to make that same decision as well. I know this, I don't know that. Then the question is, what do I do with that? Or what does the computerized tutor do with that? Um, now you might say, well, this is easy. Things you think you know, you don't study again. Things you don't know, you do have to study again. It's not that simple because there's, there's gradations even within that. Even if you're perfectly accurate, which you might not be at discerning, I understand this, I don't understand that. Um, there are some things you, you do know that you know very well, you don't need to restudy. There are some things you know right now that you still need to restudy. Mm -hmm. There are things you don't know yet that you can learn, that you can and should devote time to studying. Uh, some people don't like when I say this, but there are things that you don't know that you can't learn, that especially if you're cramming for a test, you have three hours left. This chapter is so hard, you're not gonna learn it in five hours. So wasting your three hours trying to learn this chapter, for example, is a waste of your time because you're not going to learn this chapter. You could have been studying something else in those three hours. Mm -hmm. So the overall idea is to come up with a better, with better estimates of what people know and don't know, how to guide them, whether they're doing it themselves or with someone's help, to use what time they have left to study efficiently, to maximize their, their learning or their test performance even. Uh -huh. So that's where the metacognition comes in. It's, it's thinking about yeah. what you can do to, to most benefit yourself. Yeah. Okay, great. Dr. Sarah, thank you much, very much for your time. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.